Thank you very much. Uh, this is the very last last unit of this of these three days, and uh, I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you all for persevering with us for three days. It has been a wonderful conference. It has been a truly international conference, a uh, conference with papers with great depth. Uh, we were very happy. Uh, 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 Martin, Don, uh, Helen, and myself would like to thank you all for uh, uh, for attending. Uh, this last session we will have two speakers. Uh, First Parliamentary Council of, of, of the UK, I was corrected yesterday, uh, uh, Stephen Laws, and of course Professor Jeffrey Jowell. Uh, Stephen is going to, um, I, I think, you're, are you going to start Stephen? Yes. Stephen is going to start with uh, um, a topic that some of you might find quite interesting, uh, reflections on an unwritten constitution. Uh, and, and I think Jeffrey uh, will come in later with uh, his topic, which is advising on our constitutions. And I'm always reminded that you know, we at the Sir William Dale Center always reminded that uh, Sir William was an advisor, a great advisor to three kings, no less. All three of them deposed. So uh, uh, one needs to be a little careful with uh, advice, I think. Uh, so if, if you, if, uh, Stephen, if you'd like to uh, start, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, good morning. Uh, the, the title of this conference is Comparative Aspects on Constitutions Theory and Practice. Uh, what you have before you in me is a practitioner uh, in the United Kingdom Constitution. That's arguably quite a rare thing, depending on what you mean, of course, by practice and by the Constitution. And it's inevitable that someone in my particular occupation will start with a dive straight into difficult definitional problems. But this is about practice. As the head of the Office of the UK Government Legislative Drafters, and as one of the advisors to the Government on Constitutional Matters, I regularly need to ascertain what the UK Constitution requires and to give practical advice about its effect and application and often, too, about changing it. So I'm responsible for writing the written bits of the unwritten constitution. Uh, what I propose to do is to offer you some reflections on that, uh, perhaps from the front line of constitutional development in the UK, or at least from within sight of the front line, while, of course, being careful in the process to conform to the need for civil service discretion and to maintain the values in the civil service code, honesty, integrity, impartiality and objectivity, values that were only very recently confirmed by statute in the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act of this year, uh, an, an act, as you'll have seen, that described itself in this respect, as in others, as reforming the Constitution. Civil service values that uh, actually date from the Northcote Trevelyan reforms in the middle of the 19th century, but took a bit of time to get written into statute. 150 years or so. Um, so this is not a, a paper about theory. It puts no position except that of an observer. And I expect I shall ask more questions than I shall propose answers. Uh, what I'm going to say will be a patchwork of notions and conundrums, which I hope will leave you something to puzzle over. Uh, some of them, I hope, will show that the day-to-day -day world of constitutional practice does connect in a very real way. Uh, and I've been at one of the workshops this morning, uh, which I found fascinating, uh, with the theoretical papers that have been discussed in some of the earlier sessions. Uh, there, is also, there are two reasons why this address is taking a somewhat piecemeal and haphazard form, one more respectable than the other. Uh, the less respectable one is the uh, amount of uh, the pace at which constitutional development has been making demands on my time in the last few months in particular. Uh, the more respectable one is that an approach that emphasises the uncertainty is ahead of what is uh, more clear, also provides a pleasing metaphor for the UK's unwritten constitution, uh, a collection of complex and difficult questions, to most of which the answers are not yet fully worked through and maybe never will be. Uh, the Constitution of the United Kingdom is, as we all know, unwritten. It does not, of course, mean that it's not written down anywhere. It certainly does mean, though, that it's not written down in a single document. It means, too, that it is not, at least formally, uh, subject to any form of entrenchment. And it also means that, insofar as it is written, it is not written down in documents all sharing the same legal or otherwise authoritative status. 
Indeed, the document in which you find a rule is only a provisional indication of how important that rule is likely to be in practice. Reflecting on what the process of giving constitutional advice involves in practice for me, uh, I come up with the uh, a somewhat complex process. First, I need to take a limited amount of statute law and an understanding of various common law rules, including those uh, governing the royal prerogative, so far as they apply to the situation in hand. Uh, you then need to ascertain the constitutional conventions that apply to that, or perhaps to a comparable situation, so far as evidenced by past practice and any recorded understanding of what's normal, with recent practice carrying slightly more weight than past practice. The final step is to ascertain the principles that can be inferred from the law and the convention practice, and to apply them to the situation in hand, so far then, going back to the beginning, as to check that they're still consistent with the law. The diffuse nature of the UK Constitution demonstrated by this process uh, does exist does, it does present a problem of definition uh, and with achieving uh, transparency for the process of working the Constitution. The Constitution exists, we, we all know that, but we cannot find it in a single document and we cannot easily identify it by other means. Nations whose basic constitutions are contained in a single document can often say that that document too is supplemented by rules and other laws and documents and practices. But at least the, the basic document is a point of reference back in order to define what's constitutional. It's not a thing we have the benefit of. From time to time, there are calls for the UK constitution to be written. It was something that the last government considered and it started a consultation on it in the 2007 governance in Britain. Uh, paper. Now, at times of calls for a written constitution, it's possible for the first parliamentary council to be tempted to get excited at the prospect <laughs> of becoming the person who will pen, or perhaps these days more accurately type, uh, the words that will define our national constitutional settlement in one's fantasies, maybe for centuries. Uh, but in my experience, the next emotional response follows on quite quickly. And it's one at um, complete funk at the prospect of identifying the matters that will need to be included in the Constitution. Where does the law end and the ordinary law beginning begin? Where does law in this area begin and where does it end? The authors of most constitutions have to cope with the question of what goes in and what stays out. But whoever sets out to write the UK Constitution from where we are now, uh, the, the problem is what's already in it and what is not. The constitutions of most nations have their origins in events that have required a clean sheet, a new start, independence from some outside control, or an internal insurrection overthrowing the status quo. A revolution, at least uh, in the technical legal sense, if not in the uh, more uh, disturbing sense. Most of these revolutions have occurred since literacy became common amongst the governing classes, and the revolutionary classes as well, and very often they've led, been led by lawyers with a consequential legal character to be what emerges. It is actually quite remarkable how revolutionary most lawyers are. Um, we, we had some of them playing an important part in our own revolutionary events in the 17th century. But on, by contrast, I think it's probably worth noting that England, um, from 1215 onwards and Magna Carta, is a country where intellectualism has seldom been a, at the centre of political upheavals. Uh, where in other countries a new start or a clean sheet has resulted in a constitution, that's been because what was required was a new vision for the nation, an articulation of its new identity, and sometimes too the articulation of the settlement and the compromise between the competing parties or communities whose differences and conflicting interests have brought the community to the point of revolution, or who have sometimes, against their will, been forced to combine in a single nation. Indeed, it's often this feature that creates the need to entrench provisions, something to which I shall return. It's been suggested, I know, that, I, that this feature of our constitution, uh, the, the, the absence of this feature from our constitution, is produced by a characteristic British taste for pragmatism and <coughs> continuity. I question whether we are unique in seeking to emphasise continuity and change, uh, or uh, unique in being pragmatic. Uh, to me, the fact that we have never satisfactorily defined the whole picture in a single document seems to me more to be the result of factors that are uh, more, more technical and ones which, as a drafter of legislation, I am 
familiar with. Anyone who was given the task of producing a written constitution for the UK would immediately be confronted with the question whether what was wanted was in fact a fresh start, a new conception, or just codification. And it seems to me that anyone asked for at any time to produce the UK constitution uh, for any reason is bound to have to do something, a large element of which will be codification. Uh, without a major root revolution, even one in the technical sense, to make the argument for a written constitution, to justify uh, establishing a radically new basis or framework for the exercise of power and influence within the United Kingdom or Britain or England and Wales, uh, continuity on many matters would be inevitable. There might be political arguments about rebalancing various aspects of the constitution, but the essence of any argument for moving from an unwritten to a written constitution would, as I understand it, be likely to be confined to the need to move to a form of what we have that is able to attract more widespread popular understanding and therefore loyalty. Even if that involved major changes to or from the existing constitution, the question that would arise would be the same question that confronts legislators, drafters, on every subject. How to balance the conflicting demands of securing the change that is required on the one hand, and on the other of providing sufficient flexibility to ensure sensible solutions are found for situations that you've not thought of. This is the problem we have with every piece of legislation. How much should you ratchet the change? How much do you need to make a change to stop people doing the thing that you wanted to make the change to stop? Any decision to have flexibility for existing mechanisms to develop solutions will necessarily involve preserving continuity with something that, as I've indicated, is very difficult to find in the first place. I've been talking a bit about codification. Now, I know there are people here from, from different jurisdictions, so I'd I better um, revert to type and just identify what I mean by codification for a moment. Uh, a codification to a UK lawyer is the enactment in statutory form of the existing law in whatever form it currently exists. It's distinguishable from consolidation, uh, which I think in EU jurisprudence is known as codification, hence the confusion. Uh, a consolidation is a reenactment of existing statutory provisions in a modernised and coherent structure, and with a modernised and more consistent form of language. But in both consolidation and codification, uh, uh, it, it's the intention, but something that is enormously difficult, to avoid a change. With codification, the change in the nature of the law makes it almost impossible to avoid a change of substance resulting from the mere process. So re to reduce the common law principles of contract law to a series of codified statutory provisions would inevitably lead to a degree of rigidity, rigidity that would produce something different. I, I remember I, I, I uh, was involved in drafting a piece of legislation that was changing uh, the contract law on the carriage of goods by sea to change the person in the chain of owners of the uh, goods being transported uh, who had the cause of action at a particular time. It seemed very simple when we started. It became infinitely more difficult when we realised that we had to take account of whether we could be sure that the courts would uh, change the rules about who had suffered damage to match the change in the cause of that action that we had effected. Could we really rely on them saying the person we now said has the action is the person who suffered the damage when previously they thought it was somebody else. Um, in some ways, the difficulties of codification in every sphere, including the constitutional, can be illustrated in reverse by those cases where the reproduction of a common law rule in statute effects, and indeed was intended to effect, a change, even without any ostensible change to the legal proposition that applies. I joined the Home Office in 1975. One of the first bills I had to work on uh, was a private member's bill that sought to deal with the extent to which the victim in a rape case could be cross-examined about her previous sexual history. In short, at the time, uh, and it's happened since, the feeling was that defending counsel were tending to cross-examine uh, in a way that was oppressive and resulted in information uh, going to the jury that tended to trigger irrelevant prejudice. Uh, however, the law at the time was, and it had always been, that the cross-examination was allowable if it tended to adduce evidence that was relevant. 
and the decision on that question depended on the discretion and judgment of the trial judge. We sought over several weeks to draft a provision that would define when previous sexual history would be relevant and when it would not. We built an elaborate uh, rule based on the similar fact rule, which is the uh, rule that we have in the English law of evidence, for allowing evidence of previous criminal history to be adduced against the defendant. And the bill was introduced with that rule in it. In Parliament, however, the whole thing fell apart. The rule we devised was thought to be much too complicated to be acceptable, uh, and of course there were different views about whether it went far enough. The bill uh, eventually passed uh, with an amendment that replaced the rule we drafted with a rule that gave the judge the discretion to decide whether to allow cross-examination of the woman on her previous sexual history. The purpose, the only purpose, was to reset the clock. And for a while at least, and some of you will know this story has a a subsequent history and an ECHR case about it as well, the new provision did work to change the way the law operated in practice, even though the new provision, logically, was no different from the rule that it replaced. There was a similar approach more recently in um, uh, the Act about witness anonymity. So you can see that even the codification of the Constitution Uh, could end up changing it by resetting the clock on discretion. The fact that something is expressed in statutory form uh, will introduce a different form to a rule uh, so that a court has to assess uh, afresh the degree of flexibility involved. Uh, One particularly difficult area for the codification of a constitution is constitutional conventions. Now, there's a lot of theory about constitutional conventions. Dicey argued that their breach is likely to lead to a breach of the law. That's not my observation as a practitioner. Uh, My observation is that conventions are uh, rules that define the characteristics of relationships between those with uh, power or influence in society. They need to be adhered to in order to avoid the relationships becoming dysfunctional not because of any formal sanction or connection or consequence of breaches of the law. The relationship between a man and his wife is made up not only of the written documents they use to define it, mutual wills, how they split the interest in their main home, the terms of any prenuptial agreement they choose to enter into. It consists also of the practice of who does what, who deals with the plumber, who books the holiday. It also covers uh, whether the man comes home on Fridays with flowers and what birthdays and anniversaries are celebrated. How much, say, would it be acceptable... I I was writing this on Sunday, actually. Um, How much would it be acceptable to become assessed with a football defeat? Um, And these things tend to be defined uh, by events in the course of the relationship, and it's the events that occur that are factored into how the relationship develops and changes. And just like rules that define human relationships in this way, constitutional conventions operate in a similar way to ensure that compromises are reached in the day-to-day business of government and that trust is maintained. Of course, countries with written constitutions have practices of this sort too. The President of the United States uh, has to rely on Congress for supply. Um, The USA Constitution, unlike the Westminster model, does not give him uh, necessarily effective control of the votes for supply. Nevertheless, in practice, occasionally there's a continuation resolution, but in practice, um, compromises are reached. What is different is that in that case it is clear uh, that the sanction for the absence of a compromise is a legal deadlock. That's not the situation in the UK Constitution. Um, While I'm talking about money, actually one very important aspect of the Constitution of our our Constitution that it seems to me uh, doesn't receive enough attention is uh, the whole series of rules about public money Uh, the accountability of the departmental accounting officer, the possibility of uh, departmental directions to the accounting officer, Um, going back to the marriage, who makes sure the bank balance, um, the bank statement balances, Uh, who has the ultimate say when it comes to a dispute about uh, spending. In the UK, the sanction for breaching the convention is that the breach creates uncertainty about how the relationship will develop in future. A husband who forgets his wife 
birthday, having always previously remembered it, watches too much football, is likely to find that his relationship will need an unpredictable level of repair. Um, just as it may develop in a new direction as the result of a particularly successful uh, family holiday or a shared family tragedy. This seems to me to be exactly the process by which constitutional conventions develop and why they are adhered to. There is mutual interest in keeping things working and in reciprocity and each transaction in the relationship contributes to the ground rules for what follows. I'd I, I like to take as an example the recent questions about formation of government, um, which, of which I was, uh, as I said, an observer. The convention that was seen to prevail, uh, and I think there was a general consensus across the sphere in this, was that it was for the politicians to resolve the difficulty that the election result had sorted out. And it was their responsibility to keep the monarch out of politics. And so um, those who commented on this, uh, well, the experts who commented on this, we'll, we'll leave the, um, laptop, uh, the red tops, laptops, red tops out of it, um, commented um, that, that it was the responsibility of the Prime Minister to ensure that he remained in office until it was clear uh, by whom, uh, before whom the Queen should send for next. The sanction, that, that, if that was the conventional uh, position, the sanction was that if the Queen had become in, involved in politics, nobody knew what the consequences of that would be. One of the challenges of codifying an unwritten constitution is that, one, it may be possible but difficult to codify the substance of the rules as they are for the moment. It is a great deal more difficult, if not impossible, to give legal, legal substance to the way conventions operate or uh, to the way I have described that they develop. Uh, now, in the light of this, I'd just like to um, di um, divert for a moment and uh, say a bit more about uh, recent events uh, in relation to the Constitution uh, because the situation I described followed on from a speech from the then Prime Minister in February this year uh, when he announced that he'd asked the Cabinet Secretary to produce a Cabinet Manual. Uh, now, this was a document which would be based on a precedent from New Zealand. I don't know if there's anybody from New Zealand. Well, welcome. We will know about the Cabinet, cabinet Manual. Well, we, we took this precedent and we, uh, it was announced we would uh, produce a comprehensive account of the workings of Cabinet government, consolidate the existing unwritten piecemeal conventions that govern much of the way central government operates, and our existing constitution into a single written document. Uh, the idea was that the manual would be a statement by the executive of its own understanding and interpretation of the existing situation and would not change the relationship between the Crown or any other branch of government, nor would it be binding on Parliament. Uh, the New Zealand manual has no legal status, but it is nevertheless the authoritative uh, guide, not in a legal sense, to central government decision making and the primary source of information on their constitutional arrangements as seen by the executive. On the 24th of March this year the cabinet secretary was asked to give evidence to the constitution committee the House of Commons on the constitutional arrangements following a general election. The evidence was sought with what turned out to be accurate foresight in, in anticipation of a general e election that might produce an inconclusive result, a hung parliament. In preparation for that evidence, the Cabinet Secretary, with the Prime Minister's permission, sent to the committee the latest draft of the chapter of the proposed manual, the chapter on elections and government formation. The draft chapter set out the principles governing the dissolution and summoning of parliament. Uh, including the uh, principles I mentioned earlier. Uh, and restrictions, uh, uh, sorry, the, the uh, principles governing the dissolution and summoning of Parliament, <coughs> parliamentary general elections, government formation, hung parliaments, and restrictions on government and other activities during the electoral period. Another area of con convention, the extent to which it was appropriate uh, for ministers to make decisions during the election period and, uh, by extension, in the period after the election during government formation, uh, what is known in uh, New Zealand and Australia as the Caretaker Convention. 
In developing the draft chapter before publication, the Cabinet Secretary consulted a number of constitutional experts, including, um, uh, including uh, Sir Christopher Guite, the Private Secretary to the Queen, uh, selected uh, academic constitutional experts and previous Cabinet Secretaries. The New Zealand precedent, the draft chapter and the Cabinet Secretary's evidence uh, to the constitutional experts is all available online. Uh, the new co coalition government has not yet expressed a public view on the idea of a cabinet manual, but work on it has been proceeding with careful thought being given on how the experience of 2010 uh, and the election, the negotiations resulting in the coalition might be reflected in the manual. Uh, I, it might be interesting to you if I just gave a, an idea of uh, some of the um, chapters that it was thought uh, when the cabinet secretary wrote to the constitution committee would be included. There would be a chapter on the sovereign, succession, absence or incapacity of the sovereign, privy council, the royal prerogative, uh, um, then there'd be a chapter on the executive and prime minister, uh, appointments, uh, ministerial conduct, royal prerogative again, um, ele elections and government formation, we talked about that, collective cabinet decision making, the principle of cabinet government, cabinet committees, procedures of cabinet and cabinet committees, the role of the cabinet secretariat, ministers in parliament, the relationship between ministers and parliament, including parliamentary scrutiny of government and ministers' roles in the passage of legislation, uh, the privy council and the established church, ministers and the law, covers the role of the law officers, the Lord Chancellor, the relationship with the judiciary, litigation involving ministers, the treasury solicitor, um, Ministers and the civil service, the roles of officials, the civil service code, uh, accounting officers, which I've mentioned, special advisers, um, relations with the crown dependencies and devolved administrations and local government. Crown dependencies meaning the, um, the Channel Islands, the Isle of Man, um, relationships with Europe, and official information, how it's protected and arrangements are made for it to be accessible. The manual and the recent experience we've had, how it might operate in a situation giving rise to constitutional issues, I think is clearly worth consideration in the context of further thought that is given to the unwritten nature of the UK Constitution. Finally, when it comes to legislating change for a constitutional matter, or indeed for any other matter, uh, it's important uh, that the change should be effective. Uh, the questions that have to be asked are those that a drafter always asks. What's the purpose of the legislation you're asking for? What are the existing rules? Quite a difficult question uh, to answer sometimes. How do the existing rules fall short when it comes to achieving your purpose? What changes to the existing rules do you want to make in order better to achieve that purpose? These questions have to be asked in relation to codification itself and in relation to the changes you want to make. Uh, I said I'd say something about entrenchment. If one of the purposes of constitutional change is, and it may be, to regulate and limit future constitutional change, uh, the drafter would need to know why and for what purpose that regulation and limit is being proposed. Arguments for written constitution sometimes proceed in different directions. Do you start with what you think you should entrench and say that that is constitutional? Uh, which seems to me a more logical approach than starting what you think is constitutional and deciding that is what you must entrench. If the purpose of codification is to attract the loyalty of the public to constitutional uh, government, another question is whether that loyalty needs entrenchment in order to appear um, to, to reciprocate the loyalty that it requires. Entrenched or not, as I've said, writing a constitution for the UK would be likely to involve a significant amount of codification. If public awareness is a stronger motive than public loyalty, should a constitution be confined to the elements of the constitution that are likely to affect the public? If loyalty is sought for values, should the Constitution be confined only to those parts of the Constitution that establish values or protect individuals? Now, I know that a lot of the discussion of the last few days has been about uh, the human rights aspect and, uh, of um, constitutions and their entrenchment. Uh, from where 
my practice starts, there, there are many more aspects that need to be considered. I began typically with a question about definitions, and I shall end with one. The sort of question the draft of legislation always had to ask. The UK is a state in which an unwritten constitution operates in practice to produce our current political and social arrangements. In these circumstances, the question whether and how you would replace it with a written one depends crucially on how you define what practical changes in conduct or in attitudes you would be trying to achieve. And that is the answer you need to answer for the codification elements as well as for the new elements. Thank you very much, Stephen. Must have been very interesting because people are taking frantically notes. So it's always, it's always a good thing. Um, I w- you will be able to ask questions when we uh, 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 finish the second one, and, and I would like to ask uh, Professor Joel to come to the lecture. Thank you very much indeed. And I was asked to speak on the subject of advising constitutions. Uh, probably, although we didn't really figure this out terribly carefully, uh, to bring together some of the theory that we've heard over the last few days, and of which I totally approve, uh, into the area of practice, uh, of which I also totally approve. Um, But I'm taking the bold liberty of, because this is the last of the session, the last talk, to make some concluding remarks perhaps for the conference which as introductory remarks to my particular paper and firstly I'd like to congratulate the organizers of this conference uh, for bringing together such a really impressive collection of outstanding speakers my only frustration was not to be able to attend all the workshops I'm sure you felt that way never uh, have I um, felt so much like being uh, Caesar's Gaul and being divided into three parts and thereby able to go to all three workshops uh, at a given time. But I've learned a huge amount and it's been very, very stimulating for me and I'm sure for for all of us. And and I should also say that um, how unusual it is for those of us with uh, longer memories, if not lives, uh, the, uh, or the other way around <laughs> um, it's amazing for the United Kingdom really to attract uh, so many scholars from all over the world to talk about constitutions when it is often said as Stephen Laws has just said that it is often said that we have no constitution or that any constitution that we do have is not worth the paper that it is not written on. Uh, Of course, neither of those propositions is true. Our constitution consists of a number of established rules and principles, um, most of which, as as Stephen Laws has just said, are written somewhere, although not codified in any one place. But like all constitutions, written or not, the interpretation of our constitution rules and principles allows, inevitably, space for uncertainty. There can never be complete certainty. Uh, Even in a codified constitution, as most people who live under those constitutions know, uh, flexibility and change as well. Uh, But that does not mean uh, that we have a political constitution. Uh, The spirit of John Griffith has been above us all the time. He, the the, the dearly beloved and recently departed uh, John Griffith, who taught us all so much, um, died recently, uh, and what a great loss that is. And uh, his phrase for this country, that we have the political constitution, has been mentioned many, many times. Um, I don't think we have a political constitution. Uh, nor am I sure that we have moved entirely over, although I've contended this from time to time in rash moments, to a legal constitution. Uh, I think, uh, as, as Christoph Muller rightly pointed out, 
uh, in his uh, the dialectic between law on the one hand and politics on the other is misleading it's a false dichotomy because all constitutions are infused with both politics and legality in their establishment and in their implementation and that interplay is inevitable uh, because this involves the constitutional exercise, the constitutional enterprise involves to a great extent the delineation of the respective roles of different political and legal actors and this constitutes the heart of much of constitutional and jurisprudential theory, not least the question about the respective roles of courts and legislatures in a constitutional democracy. The other phrase of John uh, Griffith that was bandied about from, some, from time to time uh, was his notion that the British Constitution simply consists of what happens and when nothing happens that too is constitutional. With the greatest respect that too is wrong. Our presumptions of freedom, uh, our presumptions of equality and of human dignity have not merely happened. Uh, they have been hard fought over. Uh, and carefully crafted over the years so as to reveal themselves and be endorsed through established practice or statute, as we've heard, or declarations of the common law. And their aim uh, of those declarations is not merely to declare the mood of the moment, but to establish the foundational principles and rules at the heart of any democracy properly so called. Phew, having got that off my chest, <laughs> let me now return to my theme about the role of the constitutional advisor. And if I may link in that subject to some of the themes, those that I encountered anyway, uh, and read in the abstracts of, uh, the, in the, work, of, of the workshops. Um, I uh, am the United Kingdom um, member on the Venice Commission. Um, the Venice Commission is the Council of Europe body that was formed, for those of you who don't know, uh, in 1990 uh, by Professor La Pergola of Italy, who was then um, Foreign Minister of Italy, later became the judge in Luxembourg, Court of, uh, European Court of Justice from Italy. He had a vision that the uh, Berlin Wall was about to tumble down and... Uh, that uh, there ought to be a body of experts ready to give hands-on help to developing those constitutions. Um, Brit the, the United Kingdom only sent a, a member in 2000 uh, and for the first 10 years. There was no United Kingdom member because the United Kingdom member thought, well, we don't have a constitution, so what have we got to offer? Well, um, the, um, the Venice Commission uh, documents are now a treasure test of constitutional reasoning and pronouncements on common standards of European democracy. And I'm, I'm a little surprised, well not totally surprised, because the Council of Europe somehow has a much lower profile than other international bodies, uh, that uh, the pronouncements of this, this, this body are not uh, alluded to more frequently, both in academic uh, discussion or uh, in government circles when issues come up that other countries have dealt with, have come to the Venice Commission to be decided, whether it be the question of electoral systems or upper houses uh, uh, and, uh, and, and a host of other, other, other matters. Um, it has a very good website and it's a source of great constitutional instruction. Um, it deals Firstly, with country-specific issues, so initially Russia came to it, the Ukraine, Serbia, Albania, uh, uh, and, and countries like that to assist with the new constitutions. But since that time, um, other countries have come to it um, asking for comments about not only the new constitutions, or the drafting of their constitutions, or the amendments of their constitutions, but also about um, constitutional practice and public law practice and the question always is asked is does this accord with common standards of European democracy uh, in the last few years it's been extended under an enlarged agreement so that non-European members can join it 
And so Brazil has come in, and South Korea, and, and Japan, and, and Chile, and other countries. It's always had a great interest in Southern Africa. And there's a kind of export now of European standards. And I'll come to that question of export in a moment. It also, uh, in, in addition to asking, uh, answering specific questions, and within the answers it gives to those countries, there's a wealth of constitutional principle that can be extrapolated from the various responses. But it also does general papers, such as judicial independence, looking now at how independent public prosecutors ought to be, particularly when making decisions on questions of uh, national interest, when not to prosecute in the national interest, their appointments, their links with Parliament, all very relevant issues in, in all, all democracies. Counter-terrorism measures about to come out, of course. Um, constitutional Amendment, a profound paper I think on Constitutional Amendment recently, the role of the opposition, video surveillance, oversight of security services, um, control of armed forces, and so on and so on. So this is the sort of thing uh, that it does. And Cheryl Saunders uh, yesterday asked the question um, whether you know, people take note of this kind of constitutional advice that they're getting. Well, there's a huge incentive within the, in the respect of the Venice Commission. First of all, the, uh, the country itself has usually asked for advice, or the matter has been brought up by a Council of Europe body or the Secretary General saying, does this accord with, with a, a European standards? And the incentive is that for those countries that have not yet acceded to the EU, it is a kind of, of waiting room. And uh, you first get Council of Europe uh, stamp of approval, and then you can move into the inner sanctum and ask for EU accession. And it works very closely with the EU in, in that respect. So there is an incentive there. And incidentally, it applies not only increasingly to the, to the, to the new democracies, particularly the former Soviet Union, uh, but uh, to the old um, uh, and uh, it is therefore involves not only transplantation or constitutional neo-colonialism. Finland has recently asked for advice on its new constitution. Uh, Italy was referred uh, in, this, in respect of the Berl Mr. Berlusconi um, uh, owning so much of the, the control, having so much control over the media, and questions there of freedom of expression. Luxembourg has just come to the Venice Commission asking for the power, at his request, of the Grand Duke to be the reduced, so that the Convention of the United Kingdom, where Grand Duke doesn't uh, provide uh, uh, by the Convention, the, the, the Queen doesn't uh, veto legislation or hasn't for quite a few hundred years, uh, could be codified in the Luxembourg Constitution. I was a rapporteur for that session. I'm totally in favour of a written constitution. Always have been, always will be. It's so much easier. But try writing down something like the Queen shall, the, the Grand Duke shall have all the power possible, uh, but she'll never really exercise it. <laughs> um, so one has to be in their principles of representative government or whatever. Um, I've identified in my little abstract and was going to make more of this but I think there are probably more interesting issues to discuss in the next few minutes available to me uh, three different types of constitutional change which I think is very relevant in a, for the role of the advisor um, the first is what I call a convulsive change those are the never again constitutions the South Africa post-apartheid and quite a few others clean slate, let's get rid of the old and move on to a new, totally new. Um, it's an opportunity uh, that creates uh, huge problems of identifying what it is you want to get rid of and uh, what should take its place. More about that in a second. The second form of change is episodic change. That is when there is a constitutional moment, perhaps uh, something like we heard in, in one of the workshops, the, um, the, the, the Good Friday Agreement, the Anglo-Irish agreement that, uh, that was, was considered by Colin Harvey to be a constitutional moment uh, for, 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 for North, Northern Ireland and therefore leads to all kinds of new constitutional changes inevitably but perhaps not quite of the clean slate type. These things, these divisions of course overlap. Um, 
So there we have episodic, episodic change, and then we get uh, what I call incremental change, which is the kind that exactly that Stephen Law so, uh, has so succinctly described. In, in this country, there may be episodes such as the joining of the EU that do actually create more profound change than the normal incremental and other events such as that. The, there is a, a subtle difference in the way a, an advisor approaches uh, his or her task under those circumstances. Um, in each case, of course, uh, one must always take into account and learn as much as one can about the culture and traditions uh, 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 of, a, of a particular country and its, and its his, history, uh, earlier and, and, and recent history, in order vaguely to understand uh, what to do, and one has to be very humble in that respect. Uh, but in the, in the first, it's probably more important to understand what the country is moving from, clearly, if there's going to be a radical break with the past, than in the second and third. And this matter is not always clear to the participants. A good example, I think, there is South Africa. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, when I was, uh, I, I happened to be uh, teaching at the University of Cape Town at a time when the change was coming and we started a few seminars on an issue that really exercised a number particularly of the black students uh, and many others there should we have a Bill of Rights in the new South African Constitution? Is a Bill of Rights simply a bill for whites? Will it be the whites that will, will insist on their property rights and not allow distribution? Will it be the rights that will be able to disrupt the new regime without any sanction and insist on freedom of expression and so on. Um, much else besides, uh, is administrative justice a, a right or isn't it? Uh, and what about academic freedom? There were the most uh, extraordinarily lively debates then and in subsequent uh, meetings that we had uh, in Ditchley Park, I remember Cheryl Saunders was there, over academic freedom. Why should that be a right in the constitution in South Africa. You have to understand that it was the universities that were sat upon by the apartheid government perhaps at the same time as they were introducing their heinous apartheid structures in other areas to understand why academic freedom becomes so important for South Africa. You have to understand, and the South Africans initially perhaps didn't quite even understand it themselves, uh, that the apartheid regime was not only about horrific uh, race discrimination, but also about uh, tyranny and the dominance of an unyielding bureaucracy to understand why it was in South Africa and in South West Africa as there was in Namibia now that the notion of a right to administrative justice first emerged. Kyrgyzstan uh, two days ago approved a new constitution following the coup there. This is an example of, uh, I'm not sure whether here, now, Kyrgyzstan, initially former Soviet Union country, gets its new constitution, clean slate, but gives a lot of power, of which more in a second, to the president. Um, and uh, there's a coup a, a few months ago. It wants to give much more power to parliament. Is that episodic uh, or is it convulsive change? We're not quite sure. Um, possibly a, a mix of the two. Uh, this time round it has its new constitution which it submits to the Venice Commission. We note that they, there is a provision there that uh, a party, no party is permitted to obtain more than 65 out of the 120 seats in the Legislative Assembly. This seems to a number of the members undemocratic. Why should you deprive representation in Parliament to a party that might get 90 or 100 seats. This is deprivation of representative government. It's not the right thing to do. On consideration, you look into it. What is the circumstance? What is the history? What is the culture? You had a previous president who was totally domineering and dominant. And the party was totally dominant. We want to prevent that ever happening again. And as a transitional mem measure, we'll say 65 maximum to pre prevent any one party dominating for the next few years to take us through, perhaps to another constitution in a few years' time. In the end, a stamp of approval was given for that provision, and not for the provision that said we want to abolish the constitutional court, 
because of what it, uh, how, it, how, it, how it vapidly endorsed every tyrannical act of the previous president. Yes, a constitutional court, but let's look instead at new ways to appoint its membership. Um, there are m- many other examples. I want to talk about the question about of universalism and relativism as far, uh, insofar as constitutional provisions are concerned. That came up in one of our, uh, our discussions. And most of the speakers uh, that I've heard all, all throughout here went out of their way to avoid the arrogance presumption that all countries should adopt the so-called Western model of democracy. Of course, constitutional colonialism should be avoided, as I have said, uh, but my position is far uh, less relativist uh, than, than many others that have spoken at this conference. Uh, I believe that there are features of a democratic state uh, and many features that brook simply no compromise. Um, of course, it is within the right of a country to reject the notion of judicial independence. If they want to make judges the puppets of the president, it is their right to do so they may eschew uh, the notion of political control of the military. They may introduce censorship. They may imprison people without trial. Uh, But to insist that these are crucial elements of any democratic state is not to impose liberal notions upon societies that are culturally communitarian or are unable um, culturally uh, to accept the notions of Western democracy. It is simply to condone and to encourage tyranny. We need not be Eurocentric, of course we should not be, uh, but we are entitled, perfectly entitled, to be demo, demo-centric. Um, and as the, the, the issue that um, confronts an advisor in, in, in this case is sometimes extremely difficult. I was asked uh, on one occasion to, to uh, assist a country's constitution uh, that was run by a domineering uh, president. The constitutional court uh, had held uh, that he ought to um, th- 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 that, that he had now the, the, the democracy had to be introduced and, and, and the tyranny the real dictatorship should be d- d- dissolved. And then 9-11 happened and I got a call saying, um, uh, I'm sorry, the instructions we gave you previously are a little altered now. Um, obviously, because of this international crisis and our country's involvement here, uh, we need to uh, some different advice, which is to legitimize the continued rule of our president. Um, Now, on that occasion, um, I said, rightly or wrongly, and I'm not trying to be sanctimonious here, I said, I'm sorry, I do democracy, I don't do tyranny. It's not in my bag of tricks that I carry. Um, The team that I put together with me all went out and gave advice. Maybe they were right. Uh, They explained some of the dangers, and that's one of the things that one has to do. Uh, And indeed, um, I gave a sort of absolutist view a second ago and there's some aspects of democracy and rights that are not absolute that, that can be qualified one refers to speech but then what about uh, the, the, the banning of hate speech or in respect of equality uh, affirmative action and some of the choices are not so stark and perhaps it's really up to the advisor to say you know I I couldn't advise this. I do the cab rank principle. I act for government. I act for any client that wants. I'm a hired gun. I'll do exactly what you want. I can only point out, and here I think the ethical situation comes in, that if you do thus and such, you are moving away from common standards of democracy and be it on, on your head, but the choice is, 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 is really yours. Um, the, 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 the question of the place of the head of state of the government often comes into this category. Um, Sometimes patronizingly, I always thought, uh, advisors in Africa and in East Europe uh, would really assume uh, that they ought to to advise a system that provided a, a, a really strong 
centralized head of state. They assumed that there were kind of um, that, 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 that there were um, concentric um, forces, uh, centripetal forces uh, uh, involved in, in, in those countries. After all, it was said, Africa has always had strong chiefs who could just tell everybody what to do. After all, it was said, uh, the Soviet Union always wanted a czar and, and, and all those countries there only respond decently and properly to a very strong leader. Well, you can have a strong leader, uh, but there are degrees of strength uh, uh, to, to be introduced. And I think that many of the advisors, and I mentioned in one of the workshops, I had a student from Zambia who wrote a magnificent thesis, I thought, on the mistakes that the British government had made when independence was given to Zambia, of making those kinds of assumptions, not only assumptions about a, a, a head of state who could do just almost what he wanted to do uh, over and above parliamentary approval, but also uh, about the role of the party um, being too powerful, and assumed that those assumptions were just uh, t taken on board because the powers that be who gave the instructions, who happened to rule at that particular time, um, had an obvious vested interest uh, in providing that kind of absolutist power or the possibility of continuation of their power into the future. And this is a, a real question for any, any democracy and of course a question for any advisor and any constitutional drafts person. To what extent are you freezing in time a pre-commitment that any constitution is, really a pre-commitment, um, that actually reflects the values of those in power, their philosophy in power at any particular time. You get socialist democracies which try and do that. Does this occur through the provision of um, socio-economic rights? Are you providing for a kind of redistributional democracy forever, even though that may not be the will in the future? Subject, of course, to amendment. And one has to just somewhat be aware of that and guard against that notion of perpetuation. The other uh, aspect of the advisor that, that I've always found rather interesting and compelling is that the advisor is not only there willy-nilly, whether or not he wants to or she wants to or not, to give advice on so-called the law. Um, the advisor inevitably is involved in mediation. Uh, simply because there are always warring factions uh, involved in the drafting process. And that mediation can be a trying business. It's a question of knocking heads together. I would say, I sometimes say it's sort of 40% mediation, 60% law. It varies depending on the issues in the countries. I recently uh, advised uh, on the New Cayman Islands Constitution, British Overseas Territory, but it required a new constitution and a Bill of Rights uh, uh, to have a somewhat different relationship with the UK than it had before. We took it all the way through to uh, Lancaster House here and it now is a constitution with a Bill of Rights. But my word, the opposition we got to the notion of uh, a Bill of Rights uh, by church groups within the Cayman Islands, they saw this as Sodom and Gomorrah. They saw this uh, again, with all due respect, uh, as a, a move immediately into gay marriages and into the state specifying that uh, people working in church organizations could, only, could be of any, any religion or any persuasion or none. Uh, this terrified them, but good people and true, I, I have to say. Um, but so what was my role I, I, I had actually to go into those churches uh, and, to, and speak with the people and talk them through it and, and this is another factor that comes out can one suggest in, in such a situation a compromise uh, I'm deeply committed to, to human rights and to equality on the, all sorts of basis including sexual orientation but uh, w would it be uh, a, an acceptable compromise to define marriage in the Cayman Constitution as a union between um, a man and a woman and then leave it to legislation 
and public opinion in the future to decide whether they would like to have civil partnerships or indeed gay marriages or whatever you like in the future. This compromise was the only way in which that constitution would have gone through with the Bill of Rights. Without it, the referendum would have rejected it. In the end, the referendum actually approved the constitution and a full uh, and elaborate Bill of Rights, taking in a number of the South African provisions about uh, uh, just administrative action, about environmental rights, but that compromise in that clause and one or two others relating to the church still is there today. Um, Two neglected aspects of constitutionalism um, which perhaps haven't been as fully explored, again subject to my not being present in workshops here, is constitutional amendment. Uh, a, 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 large, a large topic um, involving um, the pre preservation of a degree of flexibility. You have pre-commitment, but what extent is there pre-commitment, to what extent can there be amendment? Even with entrenchment, uh, a majority over a certain amount in virtually every country, except somewhere, there's no possibility of amendment of certain aspects of bills of rights, uh, is and is probably nece and necessary. And then there's the question of implementation. Now that is a massive subject of constitutional implementation in our remedy. Certainly in this country, the judicial remedies that we have are not sufficient in my view, says he with a sweep, uh, uh, to provide for the implementation of a number of constitutional provisions uh, that uh, uh, have been absorbed into other, other, uh, into other countries uh, recently, recent new constitutions, particularly the socio-economic provisions. We don't have these structural interdicts that allow supervision of government activity we have the basic remedies of either striking down or not striking down in our case at the moment declarations of incompatibility but where do you where do you go from from there and implementation of, and of course one thinks of the old Russian constitution the new Belarus constitution that came to the Venice Commission what a beautiful constitution there's the right of young people to uh, be looked after by old people. There's the right of old people to be looked after by young people. There's the right of everybody uh, to have somebody come to your assistance if you get into a scrape or fall into a river or whatever it might be. It's a marvellous, perfect, beautiful constitution. It is, it is poetry. Uh, will it ever be enforced on that ground? Of course not. Any less than the previous Soviet Union contribution was enforced. Wonderful. Congratulations. Vodka all round. Let's put it in the bottom drawer now and get on with being nasty to each other. I have perhaps been a little too... Uh, a little... <laughs> a lot too absolutist uh, in my approach today. And um, I, I did, however, uh, pay lip service at the beginning to, to humility. Um, and one must not impose standards uh, on, on, on ground in which they will not ever grow uh, and where they simply do not belong. Uh, but we have to remember uh, that um, since Ghana has become democratic, poverty in that country has halved. There are brilliant economists who say that there's a cause and effect there. Um, uh, one has to remember that in South Africa, despite all its, all its problems, it has now become an exporter of constitutional standards. I mentioned a couple that went to Cayman, that went to, quite a few of those provisions have gone up through Africa, are being considered in our papers here about the right to administrative justice, environmental rights, and so on. Out of Africa, let us remember, communitarian values or not, uh, th those provisions came. And I do believe that the time has come now to develop with more vigour than hitherto international standards, not only of human rights, but of democratic constitutionalism. Um, there are bodies uh, that I mentioned, uh, I mentioned the Venice Commission, of course there are others, many others as well that I, I haven't mentioned. Um, and what they do is they recognise that fundamental democratic imperatives uh, need much more vigorous assertion than they have received 
up to now as universal aspiration.